it's going to be. A At this time, I will call the meeting of the Marshall City Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. We do have a full agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? If not, we'll operate under that agenda. The um, first item then would be to consider the approval of the minutes of the of two work sessions that the City Council held, both one was on August 3rd, the other August 10th, as well as a regular meeting which was held on August 12th, August 10th. 2021. So the council does have the minutes of all of those meetings. Are there any corrections to note? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Russ to approve the minutes of those meetings as they have been presented. By voice vote, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We have a number of public hearings this evening. The um, And I'll maybe preface the public hearings about kind of the procedures that we'll go through for public hearings. Uh, when, when we open the public hearings, uh, we'll have a brief presentation about what the topic is that will open up for public input. Um, if individuals are in the audience and would like to speak, we'd ask that you come up and um, speak into the microphone at the podium here. And if you have any materials that you wanted to show, let um, um, the technician in the back know and he can adjust the cameras and so the document camera can be used and also if you come up um, give your name and your address too so the clerk will record that in the minutes okay so with that our first public hearing is on the 2025 MnDOT college drive improvement project and once again we'll have a public hearing Following the public hearing, then we'll consider the resolution of municipal consent uh, and layout approval. So I will call on Jason Anderson, who's the city engineer and director of public works for the city of Marshall to conduct this public hearing. Jason. Thank you, mayor and, and council. I'll actually turn this presentation over to Jesse Vlamic, pro, uh, project manager for MnDOT. And I know he has Dickie Farrington with SEH along as well. So Jesse. Okay. <clears throat> And welcome, Jesse. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Mayor, City Council members, my name is Jesse Valamic, Project Manager for State Project uh, 420440, Reconstruction of Highway 19 College Drive from uh, 4th Street to Bruce Street. I'm here today with uh, Nikki Farrington from SEH, who is our uh, Layout Design Project Manager. And we're here to attend your public hearing, um, give a quick little update on the final uh, layout identified as layout 1A for state project 420440 and answer any questions that may come. Um, with that, the uh, quick project overview, uh, the reconstruction will begin at 4th Street and end at Brewer Street with roadway improvements, intersection improvements, improvements to safety, improvements, to use, improvements for people who walk and bike, we will replace city utilities and improvements to drainage. In addition to that, if you note on the little clip, it's the dashed uh, purple line. Um, MnDOT will also be updating sidewalks and pedestrian curb ramps from Marlene Street to 4th Street on both sides of Highway 19. Now that is not part of the layout, but it will be part of the overall project. Um, so with that, just a quick little overview of um, the uh, intersection improvements that we will do. Um, 4th Street will have bump outs with added, will be added to all the corners to reduce pedestrian crossing distance. Uh, Timmerman Drive will be converted to a one-way with additional parking. Artillery Drive will be closed. Highway 19 Country Club Drive and 2nd Street, a roundabout design will accommodate all types of traffic, including large trucks. Greeley will have bump outs that will be added for pedestrian crossing distance reduction. Uh, Saratoga will remain signalized. Marvin Swan Memorial will be a right in, right out. Main Street will remain signalized. Lyon Street, replace the signal with stop, seats, with stop signs on Lyon Street. 
Between Lyon and Marshall Streets, there will be a raised median, marked crosswalks, and a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Marshall Street will be a right in, right out with a raised median and marked crosswalk. Third and Park Avenue, raised medians provide a refuge for pedestrians crossing third and Park Avenue. Between High and Whitney Street, there will also be a raised median, park, marked crosswalk, and rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Boulevards at Whitney Hill and Minnesota Streets will be narrowed. And I know that was a, a very quick overview, but uh, I feel that the council has a very good understanding of the uh, uh, upcoming project. I've been here several times and discussed it with you. So with that, um, if you have any questions for myself, Nikki or Jason, who has also had a lot of input on the layout. Any questions the council has for Jesse? Mr. Mayor, just a question. I've had constituents ask me, are there going to be left turning arrows on Saratoga? Left and that signal? turning arrows. On, can you zoom Say, in on that little spot? On Saratoga itself? No, on, on college, when uh, you want to make yes. a left turn on yes. Saratoga. So right there. You can see that there will be a okay. left turn. The right turn will go away. There's okay. a... Currently, there's a dedicated right turn on college. But I'm, I'm talking about on the signal itself, will there be left turning arrows, left turn arrow, left turn arrow prior to the other direction come, turning green? I, that I cannot answer at this time. I'll, I'll okay, look into that. We'll bring that, that up as we're going to design and with the traffic okay. engineering portion that of it. That would make sense, Council Member Labatt, because that gets really active it gets, in the morning and night. Yes, it get, does so get backed up. turn arrow may actually be beneficial for a traffic flow there, otherwise people wanting to make a left okay. turn no, we'll probably will not be able to. In, in both times. directions, yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Any other questions that the council has? Just, and, and the other question I have, I think, and maybe you'll address this later, you're going to do this over two construction seasons, correct? That, that's what we're anticipating, that it'll take two construction seasons. We don't want to shut the whole thing down at one time, so it'll be staged, and, and with it being concrete, you can't just put vehicles break back on it like you would be able to with petuminous. So the major underground will all be taken care of in one year or are you going to divide the project up? And I think it'll be segmented. Okay, yeah. okay. We're, we're, we're going to get into that and we get into the details of you know what, what it's going to take to uh, replace all the city uh, sanitary, water, the storm sewer, all that will be all detailed out as we go and okay. we'll work Thank with you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I, we may invite you back up if yep. there's questions that come up. Absolutely. And so we'll open up for any uh, member of the audience that wishes to um, ask any questions or bring up any input. Welcome, Dr. Offalter. Yes, I'm Leroy Affelter, or AKA Dr. Affelter. Lived on 302 Gene Avenue for 58 years, 59 years. I've been living in Marshall for 63 years, and I've been aware of a lot of projects in town. The last one we finished was in one in 06, which some of the people here will remember. Um, I had a few questions, and I've already talked to Jesse, <laughs> Jason, about uh, some of these things. So I'm bringing it up now to actually bring it so that the public can be aware of the questions that I had. They've answered some of them and I'm pleased with some of the answers and not pleased with some. Oh, I forgot to reach you, I'm sorry, Sherry. Sure. I'm supposed to say Mary, mayor and councilman, but I'll come back. To uh, anyway, as I present this, and you haven't said that there's any kind of a time thing, I'll try to be brief but if the music starts going off, I refuse to sit down. <laughs> now, first of all, is starting at the Whitney portion and looking at the Whitney Street and the high, which is not going to have anything here other than you're going to have bus exchange going down to the school. Now, our daughter went to Eastside grade school back in 66, and Carol taught there in 61, or 60, I guess, even. Uh, and there the buses stopped on Whitney, Whitney Street and dispatched students. They didn't go down the other way. And they had pay, pay, uh, students coming in that way. Uh, now, 
I think they're having to use the one on there because of the church in the, in the parking lot. Uh, it's something that I just want to make sure they don't try to put traffic of any nature down high. I was there the other day, and it's so narrow. You have no visibility looking over to, towards Jewett's house, if anybody knows who he was. And the other way, there's not any visibility, so it's dead that way. If you're coming, going to College Drive, it's all right if you're looking down to the school to the east, you can see for miles. Going the other way, there's trees right on the boulevard, you can't even see one lot. So it's pretty dangerous to have anything possibly coming through on High Street. Whitney, Morningside Heights, my parents-in-law lived just one block up from that and one of the first residents in there. And that's why they got the medians in there. So it's just kind of a special area. Uh, easy for children to get, but there are also children that go up to the Catholic school, same street. So any passages for children going one from one side of the street to the other, when they were there, they had, they had stop and go lights plus crossing guards. So I still question whether or not it's going to be a safe entry for the children crossing there. Um, I'll, as I said I'd stop there, Jason and Jesse, if there's any questions that you wanted to bring up before I go on to the next one. Yes? Why, why, why don't we keep going? And okay. Then, then... And you'll remember, you'll write down what I'm presenting. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things I brought up to them, and there, as you remember, we were talking of, of a median downtown. <clears throat> but the, uh, how are the media, these, these safe zones going to be cleared of snow? On College Drive or even on Main Street, MnDOT comes down there three or four times or five times a day going 80 miles, just going very fast, pushing all the snow up onto the sidewalks on the residential and business sides after they've been already been shoveled. But what are they going to do with the crosswalk, the median? Are they going to go off in there in the middle of the day and shovel it? Or are they going to make sure when the kids come there at 7.30 in the morning, they're going to be shoveled? Yes, the, the highway will be cleared, but will they? And I, I asked this, I think I asked someone, are those handicapped things or are they going to be handicap accessible, those things? And if there's only one, that means you still have to walk the whole expanse to get to that. So how can, you, how can a person with a wheelchair or a baby buggy or anything get to get that to that safe zone, if you, unless you clear it? But you're going to have to have it cleared. I, I was only over in Third Street, you know, for, since 64. And we went out, and I went out in the noon and shoveled the walk, made sure it was clear for pedestrians. And businessmen up and down Marsh or Main Street did the same because they wanted business. They didn't want to have any accidents on it. So how are they all the way? This, so this is not just that one over there. It's the all the way down wherever they have those. You're going to have to sign something to make sure the snow is off of that. So the safe the safe zone. I kind of wonder the safe crossing over by Liberty Park. I haven't seen too many people crossing that highway from Walnut Street over to Liberty Park. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I haven't seen too much, but they're going to put a crosswalk right in that area. Um, let's see. Oh, the other thing is when, you, when you're going out of town from downtown, you get to where the, the uh, concert is, and the speed accelerates when you're hitting that curve. So by the time you get to going around that curb, you better not try to make a right turn on Park Avenue because you have to slow down. And the ones behind you are going to probably not. I've seen it, I haven't seen anybody hit. I was hit down in, on Whitney and, and uh, College Drive this last winter because somebody, I was taking a right on that from Whitney and I was already in a position where my vehicle had made the parts of the current turn and I was able to look all almost down to the bridge. And this guy said, I wasn't going very fast. Well, he hit me on right behind the uh, uh, front wheels on the driver's side. And I measured before, it takes about four or five seconds for to me to complete a turn from, from Whitney onto College Drive. And so he was going kind of fast. So that whole stretch, they really speed up. And I don't know if they've had any traffic 
you know, things that you've measured that, but I witnessed that there, because I drive it once in a while. Um, let's see. Oh, the other one was the safe zone by Liberty Park. We talked about that with, with the staff. Um, I was at Church Christ Lutheran on Sunday morning, and uh, our church was let out at nine, and I visited a little bit in the church, and then walked down that way, and people were going really continually over to the, the service at Liberty Park, both sides of the street going down, carrying chairs, carrying those things that you have bundled up, and having to cross College Drive there. And was trying to see if, if traffic would come from either way. Now, the bump or the median that has been planned, and they said, just says maybe that can be changed, would stop before there would be a possible crosswalk going from one side to the other. So what's the median good for? You'd have to go down to the south end of it to be able to get across and use the median. Okay? So the other thing I was thinking about is, is how are the people with handicapped that going to go across there? Or is, is it possible to really have those medians give a safe entry to uh, these kids that are there? And kids are apt to push one another, so you, or they throw their cap out. Now, if they're on the sidewalk, it's probably more monitored than it is on those bump outs. Um, uh, let's see if I got anything more. Uh, well, one thing I asked the guys, because we went, <laughs> we went through that in 05 and 06, I asked them, what's the latest date? Because I know you're supposed to approve the plan and it'll go through and all of that. But what's the latest date that we can actually implement something to the plan if we decide that what you're deciding on is not really proper? When we had the stuff in 05 and 06, it was the 11th hour before the council and others finally decided to go with the thoughts of not having a median on Main Street. So I'm just wondering, this project is, what, 25? So when's the last time that you can actually accept it? And if you wait too long, they're going to have to redraft plans, which is expensive to somebody. But I think you should talk about it or think about it, or actually let the public know that this project is going to be for Marshall to last 40 years. That's what they told us on Main Street. So I'm going to use this language. You darn well better get it right right now. Um, I may be through with that. I haven't seen hear the, sort of the music yet, so <laughs> I guess unless you've got questions I can answer for you, I'm just trying to bring some of these things to the light of the public uh, because some of them are afraid to come up and speak like this. Some of them haven't paid any attention to it. Some of them won't. But I hope I've kind of picked your minds a little bit about something that has come to me in the years that I've been here, having a daughter and a wife that taught both at East Side and West Side. Uh, I thank you for the time, Sharon. I'm sorry I didn't miss you, but yeah. and uh, this is because I've got sciatic in this leg now for two weeks. I haven't been able to play golf, and I told Jason that I came down yesterday afternoon, and I got out here. And I looked at the seat; and my cane wasn't on it because I got from the house to the garage and into the car, and I asked a gentleman out here. Golly, what should I do? I'll drive back home and get my cane? And all of a sudden, hey, your golf clubs are in the trunk. Just, <laughs> yeah. just get the putter <laughs> and go in there. But I haven't used it for anything. But uh, I'm having fun, guys. I, I think you are, but you have to use a, And the other thing we haven't mentioned is, as we should have before always, is common sense should rule uh, if there's factions or stuff like that. You can hear them and you can listen to them, but don't by abide by them if common sense rules otherwise. So any questions for me, I'll try to answer. Um, I, if I, not, I, I'll sit down and yeah, listen for the music. Yeah, let me just say uh, we appreciate all of your input on this issue and other issues, Dr. Offalter. And everything that you provided today is going to be part of the record. And, you know, all this really goes to MnDOT for their response as well as the community input. So we but I'll close with this. A little levity goes a long ways, but also you can't influence and antagonize at the same time. So I don't know when, what my, how my message is received. I heard that about 50 years ago at one of our optometric meetings. So uh, it was just somebody showing 
there. So it's gone a long ways that I've carried that with me. So watch out what you say and how it's taken, and we'll be better off. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not leaving because I'm. Gonna, I told Sharon I'm going to start coming and bugging you guys. <laughs> Other uh, input from any member of the audience as part of this public hearing. Jesse, I'll invite you back up if you want to make some of the, any additional comments. Um, so yeah, we were, I should say, we, Nikki was feverishly typing some things down here. Um, and yes, let's see, I'll just go back here. Uh, the latest date for making changes. Um, so with that, like I explained earlier to Doc, is um, any major changes that would happen to the layout, I'd have to come back to the city and get approval for the layout change. Uh, minor changes, um, such as like extending that uh, median, I think we can probably do that. We just gotta be mindful of the bridge that's there because we can't um, touch the bridge as a historic bridge. So that's, that's kind of where it's at. But I think that can be extended. Um, so I got that note down. Uh, did the crosswalks near Liberty Park on the east side, yep, so that was that one. <clears throat> Consider speeds at that curve. So with that median, I think that's gonna help slow speeds. Um, reduce, having that little uh, media, or having the median in there gives you that sense that it's closing in on you a little bit, so then traffic tends to slow down. Kind of like out at the roundabout or any of those other areas, that really helps um, slow traffic. Um, and as far as uh, MnDOT and snow removal. I've had a dis long discussion with our uh, maintenance personnel and we had topics because I know there was one another individual with the uh, narrow boulevard along um, College Drive, <clears throat> excuse me, along College Drive in that same vicinity to the, uh, towards Bruce Street. He uh, was concerned about that and um, snow builds up and I had a discussion with them and they said that they would be out there removing the snow from the boulevard as it builds up. I mean, you're not gonna maybe do it that day right then and there, but as snow compiles, they will come and remove that from the boulevards. Um, and as far as snow removal between, in the median, it all kind of depends on how that median ends up being as far as the design. Is it a handicap accessible, it will be handicap accessible, but is it a median where the walk goes through, or it's like a cut through? or if it kind of goes over the top, it, it'll be an interesting, I shouldn't say interesting, it'll be, it'll be cleaned, and we'll get that all figured out. So. Okay, thank you. Any other input as part of this public hearing? Any other comments from the council? If not, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Russ. Discussion? If not, all in favor of closing the public hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Now you had the resolution before you um, for the municipal consent and layout approval. Are there questions about that resolution? If not, I would entertain a motion. So move. Motion Thank by you. Craig, seconded by Jim. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Our second public hearing is agenda item number three, uh, 308 Athens Avenue. This is a public hearing regarding the home property tax abatement request. And the action would be to consider a resolution um, that would approve the home property tax abatement. So I will uh, call on City Clerk Kyle Box to conduct this public hearing. Kyle? Thank you, Mayor and Council. There are, as you had said, there's a public hearing for home tax abatement. Uh, the next two items are as public hearings are also tax abatements. The only difference is the second and third are non-homestead. So we'll kind of cover everything in the first, uh, this first one here. So in your packet, uh, you do have the uh, value information, difference of improvement and estimated amount of assistance, as well as the resolution, which would approve the tax abatement for each of the properties. I can answer any questions. Okay. <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, questions regarding the um, 308 Athens Avenue, the request for home property tax abatement? Is there any input from the 
audience? If not, is there a motion to close this public hearing? So moved. Motion by Craig, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And it, then we will consider the resolution that would approve the home property tax abatement. So moved. I'll second. Motion by Russ, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Bob? Yes. I abstain from that. And note, um, Councilmember Lazinski abstains. Moving on to agenda item number four, 310 Athens Avenue. Similar request. This is a public hearing regarding the home property tax abatement request at this address. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, nothing additional to add um, on this one. Are there any input, any questions regarding this home property tax abatement request? If not, is there a motion to close this public hearing? Motion, motion by Steve, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. I need to abstain from that one. No, no, all, the abstention. Uh, the, um, we'll now consider the, was that the resolution? That was, no, that was that just was closing. the closing. Yeah, the right. So you, you did not want to abstain from closing the public hearing, did you? I think when you did yours, I think you were told you had to abstain from all okay. of it. Okay, we'll note the abstention from that. Abstain from all of it. We'll now then consider the resolution that would approve the home property tax abatement. Questions about the resolution? I move the resolution. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve, to approve the resolution approving the home property tax abatement at 310 Athens Avenue. This discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstention? Yes. Motion passes with one abstention. We'll now move then to 505 Darlene Drive. Once again, a public hearing regarding the home property tax abatement. Kyle, any additional input as part of this Nothing public more. hearing? Is there any input from the council or audience as part of this public hearing? If not, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So move. Second. Motion by Craig, second by Russ to close the public hearing. Discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. Note one abstention. We'll finally, we'll consider the resolution that would approve the home property tax abatement on 505 Darlene Drive. So moved. Second. Motion by Russ, seconded by John. Discussion? If not all, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. I abstain from that. Uh, with one abstention. Uh, just a note for the audience, those, these actions were all as a uh, city council um, incentive for home construction uh, in the city of Marshall, and it, it is a multi-year property tax abatement, and it ratchets it down for, over the course of several years um, to provide an incentive for new home construction. It's been very popular, uh, especially this past year. We'll move then to agenda item number six, uh, Project PK001, this is the Independence Park Trail Replacement Projects. We will consider the award of bids for this, this project. I'll call on Jason Anderson, Director of Public Works, City Engineer, to introduce this agenda item. Thank you, Mayor. At the August 10th meeting, the City Council authorized staff to advertise for bids for the replacement of all of the multi-use trail within Independence Park. The proposed improvements would replace all of the bituminous trails with five inch concrete trail sections. In addition, we included an alternate one, which is the widened path from Lyon Street to the main shelter building. And we included an alternate two, which is the area around the concession building near the baseball fields. On August 24th at 10 a.m., bids were received for the project. Five uh, really great bids were received. Uh, four, four very good ones. One was a little, a little high, but um, and those, those are shown in the resolution that you see on the screen there. The apparent little bidder here is A and C excavating of Marshall with the total bid, including both alternates, of four hundred and ten thousand three hundred and fifty-eight dollars and sixty cents. Um, they are the low bidder for all different combinations of award options. Uh, based on the advantageous pricing that was received through the bids, staff would recommend to award the base bid along with both alternates. 
um, included with the council memo are alternative recommendations that the council may make that include different variations of alternates and base bid. Um, engineering staff and parks and community services staff are here to help answer some questions. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Just maybe to go over a little bit um, for the funding for this project. Um, if the award, if the bid is awarded tonight, it is staff's intention to bring back a um, transfer resolution at the next council to use um, liquor store revenue from 2020 and 2021 to fund the project. Okay. Thank you. We'll open up for uh, questions. Questions? I have a quick question. You said alternate one is the, the road from Lion Street to the main shelter. That was replaced not that long ago in asphalt, correct? That and, is correct. And it's actually not in bad shape. I was just walking that. I mean, it's, it it was in good shape, actually. It was overlaid in, I believe it was 2016. Um, it is in fair shape. It will last another 10 years if you need it to. Um, but the great price on the concrete staff was just throwing that out as an option for the council to to get it done as five inch concrete, uh, match the rest of the park, get in, make the make the mess once, and, and leave the park. But it's certainly an option for the council to consider not awarding that alternate if you don't see fit. Yeah, no, and I would support eliminating the alternate because I hate to see, like you said, that you said yourself, that path is only five years old. There's a few locations where there's some uh, fatigue and cracking and rutting that we'd probably need to patch in a couple of years, but for the most part, you're correct. It, it'll, it'll last a little while. Other questions? Mr. Mayor, maybe not a question, but just the process of this whole thing. Um, I went back and did some research and, and I believe this item was number one on your list at the beginning of the year, your your goals for the, for happening this year. Um, well, I'm not opposed to improving the, the park and the trail. I guess I'm opposed a little bit of how the process is going. Um, this wasn't budgeted for this year. Um, and I know this was a mistake on someone's part. It's not, it's not in the CIP for this year. Um, even though the first memo we got, it was identified in CIP, it's not. And I, I verified that with Annette today. Um, this is an important project, and an important project like this should be budgeted. I mean, we're using liquor store funds, and again, uh, I believe there's a few of us in the council that want some of these liquor store funds to reduce the levy. So my question is, we've got a $500,000 project here, and if we use $200,000 from the liquor store for each year, that's $400,000. Where's the other $100,000 going to come from? And... And, and I'm sure we've got reserves or we've got something, but again, I, I just, I, I, I don't understand why this was not a budgeted item. And Russ, I agree with you on that. You and I have chatted, because I want to see some electric store revenue transferred to levy decrease. And I was sharing, you and I had that conversation earlier. And I would like to see, with you, Russ, I think we can fit it into the budget and do it next year, but I think we need to figure out how it's being paid, and we have that work session tomorrow night. Yep. Sure. Let me just comment, and Preston and her Scott can correct. Uh, the timing of the project and CIP or budgeting, earlier this year, uh, staff put forward a grant request from DNR. We felt relatively confident uh, on securing that grant, which would give us about 250000 and uh, so we did a lot of planning around that, including stormwater planning and infrastructure, which would help um, some of those needs as well. So that really catapulted it up in terms of um, staff request. It did not get formally put in a CIP, but uh, the opportunity for grant funding um, really put it in the forefront. We then did not get the DNR grant and started discussing, should we um, consider other revenue sources? We get uh, the most complaints likely, um, in, in addition to our bathrooms from time to time, which don't get ranked high if they're older bathrooms, but on the trails of Independence Park. So that's why it was brought forward um, to <coughs> council outside CAP and budgeting. And then I'm sure, I know you know this too, in 2021, 
we are utilizing 300,000 of liquor store revenue to reduce taxes. Prior to that, it's been 250,000 to 200,000. So I'd have to go back historically and look at the levels of liquor store revenue to reduce property taxes, but it does. And we are considering additional um, uses of liquor store revenue. We have to fit it in because we also wanna pay off liquor store debt early um, and as most of us know, where we're sitting is being or will be paid for by liquor store revenue, too. So it's kind of slotting it in. But I don't want to sound overly defensive because I do think those are good questions and good suggestions. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. And John. I just uh, I want to speak in favor of this project and the uh, construction. <clears throat> I think most of you know from before that I do spend a lot of time in this park walking in it, and the the paths are terrible. Um, you know, there I've seen people try to push wheelchairs on this, and it's very difficult. I've try I've seen uh, people using walkers trying to walk in this area, and it's very difficult. There's a lot of holes, uh, things. So I think this project does need to get done. I think the fact that we did not get our grant says that, you know, this is going to hit the levy no matter when we do it. You know, it's going to have a, uh, an impact on it. The fact that we're using excess revenue from the liquor store to pay for it, which is quite possibly a one-time thing, a two, uh, maybe we'll be lucky again next year and get some more. But uh, I think the fact that we're using it and using it wisely in this case, on a park that gets a lot of traffic, there's a lot of people that go out here, and uh, uh, there's hardly a time out there I see, I don't see, you know, quite a few other people out walking the park, going through it. So I think this is a good use of the, the funds. Uh, you know, we're not going to get money really elsewhere. So that's what I say. It's, it's if we wait and say, okay, yeah, we reduce the levy. It's gonna hit the levy no matter what. Somebody's gotta pay for this. Nobody else is, so it's gonna be the city. And this is a, an asset to the city. Let's keep it that way. And Steve? So I, I kind of agree with everybody. Um, obviously it's expensive. I agree with council members Labatt and Lozinski. If we're gonna have this, we should budget it. But I always think if we can get grants, and this is a great, something must qualify this park for a DNR grant. So if we applied once and didn't get it, how many applications for limited amount of DNR money are there? And what's the preclusion to applying for the grant next year? Preston, do you, can you answer that for me? I mean, is there an option to apply for the grant or another grant and get it paid for? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, to touch on that, um, Mr. Meister, the um, DNR recreation grant, we've applied um, not for this specific project, but we've applied for the grant for three different projects. Um, this year, I believe they awarded 19 um, grants to different communities. 17 of them were in the metro area, and then one went to Candy, Ohio County, and one somewhere else in Minnesota. So I feel like Although we thought we had a good partnership, we partnered with them on the fishing pier and being water and kind of doing that. That's kind of what, how our approach was. Um, I don't know. I mean, we could maybe get it next year, but maybe not. And then now the paths are in worse shape. But um, and, and we've kind of got to the point where um, I didn't feel it was beneficial to keep putting maintenance money into asphalt to patching because as you're trying to get to the spot that's bad, you ruin another hundred feet in the in the meantime. Um, and we're not ADA compliant anyways, so it was just kind of a um, double-edged sword a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we were hopeful for the grant, and it obviously would have um, cut, cut our costs in half or, or so, um, but we didn't get it, and like um, John said, it's by far our heaviest used park um, from walkers to baseball to um, you know the Relay for Life was out there, 4th of July, all kinds of events. Um, I think we need to kind of leave a lasting impression and um, what we have now has got us by over the last 30 years. Um, but it's at its point where 
it just can't sustain anymore. It doesn't have proper base, drainage. Um, and I think with the, the pricing we received that now's the time to, to do it. Thank you, Preston. So, Preston, before you go down, I know you've told me Mabe has also pledged some money towards this project. Um, yes, so for the alternate two, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the baseball field area. Um, Mabe has, they, they did give us some 15,000 towards the batting cage um, already this year, um, but they have pledged to put 10,000 um, additional dollars towards the alternate two um, for that baseball field area. And they would like to continue um, that partnership and they would pay us 5,000 next year and 5,000 the following year, similar to what they've done on past projects. So. And Craig, you had a comment? Yeah, and I just, going on what, what Preston said there, and I, I mean, I understand, I agree with, with uh, Councilman Meister, or Councilman uh, Luzinski and Councilman Labatt. I, you know, I, I could see possibly dropping alternate one. Alternate two, having sat out at the ballpark a uh, number of times for games, especially with the tournaments, if you're there all day, that it's dusty and, and you leave there feeling pretty gritty. And the community and Maba, the, our park and rec have put uh, a really good effort and a good face forward and hosted some pretty high end tournaments. And I think they've been very well received. But I think that, you know, I think the last time that park was upgraded in that area is 1988, Preston, is that correct? Yeah, we really haven't done much right. since it and so, I mean, I, I think it's it's a good investment into going forward, you know, so the ball fields alone, you know, I think merit the work. And since the light up the night, I've spent a lot more time at that park. It's, you know, on the other end of town from where we live. So we don't go there as much other than for special event. But those trails are bad. Those trails are really bad. And if we we're going to do it bituminous, I don't think we would be any cheaper because of the work we need to do to, to fix the bases up. Um, if we want to continue to partner with Light Up the Night, and I know that that uh, Prairie Home has, has invested some money into making that a, a, a regional event. Um, in order to make that accessible, I think we want to be able to have them pull their their um, carriage and things out there. And I just think that all the way through doing this the right way, doing it in concrete is right. Um, I agree it's too bad it wasn't in the budget. I know it was in our plan. It's been in our plan. Um, I think we were all surprised by the uh, accelerated performance of the liquor store and these are advantage funds and the, everything that I've heard dollar talk, I think we've still talked about a pretty significant amount of excess li liquor store revenue going to also to assist in supporting the uh, holding the levy down. So I think, you know, looking at all those pieces together, I think both items would fit and I think that uh, we should we should move forward. I mean, if we substitute a different project for that levy amount or that that uh, funding amount, and this ends up going on on the general levy, what's I mean, really, kind of what's the difference? It, we're going to do a project now or a project later. I don't see anything else earmarked with this kind of priority. That this seems to me to kind of be a good placeholder <clears throat> to put in. I don't know, Preston, if there's other park projects that we could continue to seek grant money for. I think this is probably the one though that the DNR is most interested in. But I'll, I'll let you answer that. I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, I guess to answer your question, I mean, the guidelines kind of change, but there's always projects that fit. We just thought this one was the most fitting. Sure. Th at this time, we've tried for inclusive playground. Um, one year we tried for the um, new picnic pavilion um, out at the, the amateur sports complex because it's just about adding structures to parks. So, I mean... There's a lot of different things you can do. We just thought this was the need now. So. Okay, thank you. And council, I would say good discussion. The uh, let me just make a few concluding comments. Um, you know, while we had hoped to, to receive that very large grant, um, we can't rely on the DNR to provide very large grants. In fact, many of the projects that um, we have received contributions for have been local contributions. And Preston mentioned the inclusive park at Legion Field, that was a United Way, partially funded. Um, there's other projects like Carter's Court at Independence Park and, and many others, but they're really locally uh, projects. This is a more of an infrastructure um, improvement that really improves a park, which is di difficult to have someone else other than 
the city funded. Um, Independence Park is really a signature park. It's not just a, a neighborhood park or even a city park. It really serves as a regional park. And you see regional events there, such as Light Up the Night was mentioned, the 4th of July celebration, um, all of the ball tournaments that are happening the, um, there throughout the summer. So there's lots of activity through the summer. And this is a park that also serves as stormwater management um, um, area for probably a third of the community that helps manage them um, when, we, when we do receive very heavy rains that um, this is part of the stormwater management system. And while we um, all agree that the, um, the trails are in poor condition, in fact, probably uh, hazardous condition, um, I think we would all agree they're not going to get better on their own. So they're going to either have to uh, receive some attention and some um, accelerated maintenance, which is costly, or they're simply going to have to be replaced. The, um, you know, before us tonight, the, we do have very competitive and attractive um, bids. And if we put this off, would we have the same pricing next year? Who knows? I mean, we did, we do have local interest. And while the, um, you know, we could say, what if we put that same amount for levy reduction? I would be more of a, an advocate for kind of a consistent contribution to levy reduction so we wouldn't have a, a large contribution from really what could be a one-time um, boon in revenue at the liquor store that we saw this last year go to levy reduction, and then what do you do then the year after? So it, in my mind, you know, this this is probably, and Dr. Alfalter mentioned, a 40-year investment on a road. This is probably a 40-year investment in a trail system at our regional park at Independence Park. So that would be my view. Open up for any other discussion. I, you know, to finish off my discussion, I, I think we should wait two weeks because we do our budget discussion tomorrow night where we can work figure out with budget level reduction and tie it all together and come back in two weeks and know how we're paying for it. That's just my opinion. I, I will not support it now because I don't think we know how we're paying for it. I want I honestly want to see some of the liquor store money go to levy reduction. At one point, correct me if I'm wrong, but the liquor store just to support five hundred thousand toward our levy and we're down to three hundred thousand now. No, no, I don't think it ever was at 500 in my time. So, but still, it's the liquor store is still having the numbers. You talked to Eric, and we're on pace to do that number again this year, very close to it. We're going to be competitive with South Dakota. We got to be competitive with South Dakota then, and we have an avenue to do that. Other input, my Mr. Mayor, my uh, initial discussion when we found out about the liquor store surplus was kind of in that split thing. It's a benefit. I agree. We need to reduce levy. Um, but I also know that this is going to be on the levy one way or another, and this is kind of a windfall that wasn't expected. And I'd like to see liquor store profits go into healthy things. Maybe it's my bias as a physician, but that trail is highly used. Runners, walkers, uh, families, um, like you said, regional people. I remember when we had the Schwann's um, speaker series, there was a guy that came in and said, you build parks for your people in your town. That draws people, when they see the beauty of the park and how much people in the town like it, that draws people to your town. On the same side, we have to decrease blood <clears throat> and be competitive with South Dakota because they're 30 miles away and they're getting a lot of our business and we can't change the tax structure of Minnesota. So that is what it is. So we have to do what we can. So I still think that, um, again, given um, numbers for the budget that we're going to be talking about. Um, I would still s support some money going. I don't know how much, so I would be in favor of waiting two weeks to make the decision as well. And I'd make that motion. I'll second that motion. Motion by table Steve. Table for two weeks. Second it by Jim to table this for two weeks. Now, um, Jason, what does this do to construction timing? Uh, we would have to work that out with the contractor uh, at time of award. We've had initial conversations with this contractor, and they do intend to start this fall. Uh, that is what they're telling us. I don't know if that means right away or delayed, but we do know that they'd like to start this fall. So any any tabling or delaying may delay that schedule, but I can't tell you that with any certainty. 
But I would say that we have a deadline of the project into next year. Um, ideally, if alternate two is awarded, I know Parks and the Baseball Association would really like that work to get done this fall because now they're not playing baseball. And you come around next spring and they start that work, you're, you're getting in the way of their operating of the fields. So there are advantages to making sure that the contractor can come in this fall. Yeah. I have a quick question, Bob, because it's actually three weeks because we have an extra Tuesday. I wouldn't be opposed to the council having, per se, a special section one week from now to, to discuss this because then we do our budget. We come back together in one week and, and vote on it. I think it's good to do the budget first, but I don't think we should table it for three weeks either. That, that was exactly my concern was the delay and whether or not we'd have a project that could be addressed this fall. I know it's a little extra work for staff, but I'd, I'd be very open to doing the budget and coming back shortly thereafter as a council and, and vote on this one item. Sharon, you I, I don't want to sway you too much. Let me just say that there's the budget there's no money in the budget for this project. That's why staff is recommending liquor store revenue funds. Can we shift more than $300,000 to reduce the levy? I think so. I know Annette, looking at debt reduction, would like to hold off. Um, but I think we can do that. And, you know, I've talked to Councilmember Lazinski about increasing the 300000 So... But I don't think you're going to find extra money tomorrow night. I just want to put that forward. I don't. I don't see that happening. Stephen, your motion would you be open to tabling it for discussion at tomorrow night's budget work session? I would. I'd second that. Okay. So the the motion now is it's tabled for consideration um, on the 25th of August at the regular work session. Can we approve this at a regular work session? We can. Not? We can, okay. Okay. That was going to be my question, so, yeah. Okay. Any discussion on the motion now on the floor? If not, are we ready for a vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. We'll move then to... Um, Agenda item number seven, this is also an award of bid. This is project Z87, diversion channel slope repair and sheet piling removal project. The action would be to consider the award of bid. Once again, Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, over the last several years and in a couple of different locations, the banks of the diversion channel have eroded significantly. There's also several locations where sheet piling used for uh, pipe installation were left in place and flumes and pipe outfalls need repairs. Uh, all these items have shown up in past Corps of Engineers inspections reports and they do need to be addressed at some point in time. Uh, to do so, staff budgeted $155,000 in the 2021 capital budget to perform these repairs. The project estimate at time of bid was 100 and, yeah, excuse me, go ahead. Could you use some? Um, is it possible microphone? to use the microphone to your, oh, be to your right? Uh, no, this one of these. For some reason, these three are giving us a lot of echo up here. And I don't know if that's, yeah. Okay. Are you Stretch it a little bit. Are you able to hear from, from me? Oh, from come here? up, no, come no, up, no, up, come up to the microphone. Yeah, maybe. Put you right in the center, Jason. <laughs> yeah. That might be better. Sorry. You heard that. Yeah. You know, this is the second week in a row we've had some issue with those mics. We might have to look into that. Um, as I was saying, staff originally budgeted $155,000 in the 2021 capital budget to perform these repairs. The project estimate at time of bid was $122,417. On August 18th, we did receive bids. Uh, at the bid opening, it was noted that our electronic bidding system indicated that three bids were completed and those three bids were read aloud. It was noted that RNG construction was the apparent low bid with a bid of $98,950.44. Uh, directly following the bid opening, city staff identified that a fourth bid was in fact submitted on time through our electronic bidding software. It provides a time and date stamp that verifies that it was received on time. Uh, the issue at hand was that the uh, fourth bid had not acknowledged the third and last project addendum that was issued prior to the bid opening date. 
the third addendum was issued after town and country excavating had already submitted their bid. Because the final addendum was not acknowledged by town and country excavating, our electronic bidding program identified the bid as being incomplete and therefore not read at the meeting. Uh, the proposal received from town and country was for an amount of $85,094 and the contractor notified staff that addendum three does not impact their proposal. The purpose of addendum three was to notify all bidders of an alternative method of completing a portion of the contract. After giving notice to another contractor that this uh, method was available to them, staff wanted to be sure that all bidders had that information at their disposal in, to complete their proposals. Uh, city staff conferred with city legal staff regarding this situation, and we were reminded that, as is common in mun municipal bid advertisements, the city's advertisement contains the language that the city reserves the right to reject all bids and waive informalities or irregularities. So in reviewing addendum number three, uh, it is not requiring additional information from the bidders. It's not changing the scope of work that's required to be completed. It's not changing any project quantities or a new, offering a new proposal sheet. Uh, it does not change the nature of the work to be completed. So by staff's determination, uh, we felt that it may be considered a non-material informality or irregularity. Uh, because it's more of a question and answer type of addendum. Uh, so to make an award recommendation, the city council will need to make the determination of whether a failed acknowledgement of this addendum number three constitutes uh, a material deviation and, and making the bidder a non-responsive bidder. So if council believes that the failure to acknowledge all addendums as required by our electronic bidding software is in fact a material deviation, then that would make town and country's bid non-responsive, and then we must award to the next low bid, which is RNG construction. If the council believes that the failure to acknowledge addendum three is not a material deviation, then we should award to town and country as the low bid. Uh, it is staff's opinion that the council may consider the failed acknowledgement of addendum three in this particular instance as being non-material, a non-material deviation because staff does not believe that this failed acknowledgement of this particular addendum did any harm to any other bidders. Uh, and the bid that we did receive from town and country was submitted on time. They just failed to uh, check notifications and go back in and resubmit a proposal once addendum three was issued. Uh, so there's a lot of information there and a lot to unpack and, and we can be here to answer some questions. And I know that our legal <coughs> staff is here as well. Okay, thank you, Jason. And the end kind of before we get into the discussion, thanks to everyone. There's been a, probably a lot of um, of discernment that's gone into trying to you know make the right recommendation. We acknowledge all of that. Um, our electronic software process that we've had now for some time, about a year that we've been using that. Correct. The um, That did consider the recommended bid to be a incomplete bid. Correct. Yes. Okay. Open it up for any questions or discussion. Uh, the court, Jason, before you walk away with your mic, the question I have is so all four bids are received on time. So none of these bids have been opened previous to town and country's bid coming in. They're all received on time before we looked at them. Correct. All bids were received on time, and our software does not allow us to look at any bids prior to the bid opening time. And it's just their lack of looking at it. And I'm a, as a bidder myself, they just didn't look at it or didn't acknowledge they looked at it down. That is correct. They submitted their bid on a Friday. On a Monday, we issued another addendum when the bid opening came around on, I believe it was Wednesday. Between that time of issuing addendum on Monday and the bid opening of Wednesday, they did not check their notifications. So they could be possible, if we don't accept their bid, they're being, I don't want to say punished, but kind of be put aside for being timely on getting their work done to us early, and we're issuing that addendum later. I mean, obviously, they, they had it four days ahead of time, which is good. The addendum was issued about two days prior to the bid. But their bid came four days ahead of that time. That is correct. So yes. they were very timely in getting their bid and not waiting to the last minute or anything. I, I guess I'd like to, I'd actually argue it the other way because I think that if the bid doesn't open and it, unless we can't, if, if the software doesn't tell us we got a bid 
and then we can issue addendums. Is there, there's no, nothing prohibiting us from sending addendums all the way to the day prior to bid opening, correct? That is correct. I mean, it's, it's the closer you get to the bid opening, the more you really need to think about extending that bid opening sure. date to give the contractors time to digest the addendum and, and take it into account. We but try not to issue them too close to a bid opening date. The issuance of this one was probably about as close as we would ever want to get. The, right. All the bidders that purchase the bidding key or for the right to submit a bid receive notices whenever there's a, any change or any addendum or any... Correct. All subscribed plan holders will receive the addendum notification by right. email. Sure. So, and, and that's my point. And I think one of the reasons going back why we got to the software is to not have to be arbitrating these things. And I don't think we should have to litigate this. I think that the fact that, you know, everybody's on the same page, I feel bad. I mean, I, town and country has done a lot of work for the city. They've done a lot of good work. That's a really good bid. But they, they should have paid attention to that. I mean, what if this was a significant change? Then, then what's our debate? And so now we're back putting all this back on the staff and we're really not benefiting from having that electronic bid process. That's very clear, it's very concise. It's like, you know, I'm sorry, tuition's never free. You know, maybe I'll bet you they don't ever miss an addendum again. You know, and I just, I hate to say that because that sounds cold and cruel, but I also look at it and I don't want staff to have to explain to the other three bidders that paid attention and did it. And, and who knows, maybe the other three were ready to hit the trigger and they didn't. They waited until they could consider that addendum and then sent theirs in. What if that addendum would have considered additional work? Then what would we do with, with the town and country bid? We would have done them a favor and said, we're not going to honor your bid because you didn't read the addendum, right? If, or we wouldn't have read it at all because we it kicked it out. If, if we determine that the addendum is material in nature, we, we would throw their bid out. Right. right. So, I mean, I think if it's right to throw it out, if, if it's not in their favor, then I think we throw it out when it is. I mean, if they don't meet, they don't meet. I think we, I think we have to stick to the, to the software. That's an option. Good job. Uh, well, I guess I'm just making sure I'm following this. And if I include a summary, they submitted a bid on the 13th. They received a notification that there was a possible change or something, this addendum, something happened. We don't know if they didn't read it or didn't read it, but if they, assuming, I'm going to make an assumption that, okay, they read it. There was no effect on what they bid, and they may, may or may not have been clear that, okay, they have to acknowledge that addendum. Uh, that's where the problem comes in. Is that correct? That it's, it wasn't acknowledged that basically they read the email. It wasn't acknowledged that they read addendum number three. Um, if the contractor receives a notification from us that an addendum is issued, they do all know that they need to get back in there and resubmit. I think in this instance, it was more likely that the contractor did not notice the, the email notification in time. I think that's more likely what would happen here. But okay. they, they would have to go back in and resubmit their bid, um, clicking in there that they acknowledge addendum three was issued and they agree to its contents and, and they're aware of it. And Sharon, you have a point? Well, I don't know who doesn't look at their emails over three days, but sorry. I'll let you guys decide that. Um, just, I'm sorry, Jason, I didn't get a chance to ask you these two questions. If it wasn't a, a material deviation, why did we issue an addendum? And I didn't. I don't. I didn't quite understand why the bid was opened in the first place. Should it have been opened because it was incomplete and we knew it was incomplete? I don't. Maybe legal has an answer to that too. Sure, and, and maybe our attorney wants to step in. But I, I would start by saying that um, we issue an addendum to ensure that everybody gets the notification. Because if we issue an addendum through our program, it's set up to distribute to everybody. Um, it's a good way for us to make sure if we feel like we have answered a question in a way that might give one contractor an advantage over another, we want to issue that addendum to make sure that everybody catches that information. And we've, cho we've chosen to go down the line of even along the lines of some question and answer stuff. You're right that we could have chosen to select who we wanted to and send emails about what we, and clarify a clarifying email. 
but um, it, it would be probably a little more manual effort on our part to go through and select all the plan holders and send it out because well, you no, also have to. I wasn't suggesting that because the program does that. Correct. The program can yeah. do this stuff for us, but we, we just choose to do it by addendum because we do feel that it's the best and, and tidiest way to make sure we get that notification out. And that's that's why we have the software. Right? That's why we have the software. Sure. Yeah. Russ? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jason and, and maybe Councilman DeCramer can help me out here a little bit because I believe that when we okayed the purchase of this software on Ways and Means, you very explicitly said that this will all stop the contractors from making last minute adjustments, that running up here with paper copies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that the contractors had to acknowledge every single thing or their bid would not be considered, including last minute items, whether this is a, an addendum that doesn't make a difference or like Councilman Schaefer said, an addendum that could have made a big difference. Uh, the purpose of the software was to make sure that all the contractors are on the same page and not running up here at the last hour submitting paper bids. I would say that that was probably the third or fourth item on the list of importance for us. The real big thing is to make sure that the contractors have the ability to, from their home, fill in all the information, right. not make math errors because it's done in the program, make sure that all submittal sheets, like you mentioned, are there. I agree that yeah. that's very important. It also tidies up some things on our end where we're not having to go through and check math and check things and Correct. make sure it's all there. It's all done. This is the <clears throat> about the only instance of this type of thing. This is all that can happen and from my perspective. If we issue an addendum quite late and quite close to a bid opening, we could catch a contractor off guard and they might not have time to respond. And maybe that was a partial failure on our staff's part. When you issue an addendum within a few days of a bid opening, it may be good practice to give phone calls as well because it is pretty close. Uh, I'm not excusing the behavior of a contractor for not responding to the addendum. When, when you're leading up to a bid opening, you should be on the ready to make changes for these things because it does happen. But um, I, I don't. I don't necessarily hold the contractor at complete fault either. Yeah, I know. I know. And I and I think there's nobody sitting in this room tonight that probably doesn't check their email at least once an hour during the day, whether it be on their phone or their tablets or their home computer or whatever the case would be. I mean. I'm sure everybody sitting in this room would check emails. So, for in, I don't want to say that as an excuse. He didn't check his email. I mean, it's I just can't fathom that myself. That is you probably know. true and and very unfortunate yeah. thing yeah, about right. how we live right now. <laughs> and Mayor and Council, if I may, Matthew Gross, Assistant City Attorney, on, on behalf of Dennis, he's out of the office this week. I I consulted with the engineering staff last week. The the advertisements that the city presents does reserve the right. Obviously, that's a decision that the city council has to reject or accept minor technical te technicalities or um, deviations from the bid specification. So that's within your authority to declare this a deep minor deviation and accept the bid, or you can have strict compliance with your bidding system and your bid requirements and have a, a strict policy in that regard. But if you decide that you want to go with a lower bid, you can waive that minor technicality if you determine to be so, or uh, establish a, a firmer policy. But case law, uh, bid litigation is, is quite frequent. So this would fall within the legal definition of a minor technicality or non-material deviation. Like I said, you do reserve the right. That language is in your bid advertisements, but ultimately that's a council decision on how you want to proceed going forward with policies and should this happen in the future, um, ultimately that's up to you. But you are within your authority to take both actions. Okay, thank you. Any further um, input? And if I may add yes. one more item. Um, you know, city staff would have no issue awarding to either contractor. Both are extremely capable of completing this work and doing it well. Um, I think that this is important for us to s establish a practice, as our attorney kind of mentioned, of, of how we're going to handle these going <coughs> forward. Uh, if the policy is, if it's, if it's not completed for any reason whatsoever, throw it out. That's fine. We'll be establishing that tonight. Uh, if, if we are going to reserve the right to review addendums for uh, wh whether they're material or non-material in nature and, and make a decision based on that, then that's something we can consider too. Mr. Mayor, I, I guess with that question, I want to put the litmus back because, Jason, my, my goal here with my comments and my feeling is that 
I want to make sure that because we have we have high quality, very professional, very competent staff. And I want to make sure that we give the staff all the tools and the things that they need to be successful and to have a good workspace and that we don't put undue stress and and expectations on our staff. With that said, then, is that I don't want to have you to try to keep peace a politically with the council or any other way that our staff have to make decisions or arbitrate trying to understand which way the council would want the wind to blow. So because of that, I think the more clear things are, the better directive you get, and then it gives you the ability to be professional and consistent in the work that, that you as our staff person does, and that's what I'm looking for. I have no angst against any of these contractors. I appreciate the the apparent low bid, but I also appreciate the need to to do due diligence. If somewhere in the back of staff's mind they feel like maybe we should have sent everybody an email, you know, then maybe that's a practice that you do kind of behind the scenes on a soft set if we're within four days or three days of bid opening. But you were what, five days away from bid opening? Two days. Two days. Two days away from bid opening when the addendum was sent out? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my push with this is that we put this out, you know, we're trying to set a, a good example. We're trying to, to send a message that we believe in this system and we want to adhere to it. But I also respect staff's feelings. So, you know, I, I guess I could go either way. I know how I want to draw the line, but I also understand that in a perfect world, everything's not perfect. And Steve, you have... Yeah, I just have one thing. So um, to the nature of email notifications, I don't know anything about the size or how they run their companies. I agree. Initially, I feel a little angst because it's attention to detail. If I'm sending a bid and I'm incumbent upon this bid, I'm going to be checking my email if that's the way that notification is going to be coming continuously. However, I also ha can't sit in front of a computer all day checking emails when I have work to do with other customers. And so late hour addendums, and I would consider two days a late hour addendum, I kind of go with Sharon's question, which I don't didn't hear the answer is why the addendum wasn't why wasn't that done earlier? Was that sure. a failure of City Park to not have that potential in there earlier? Uh, I I don't look at it that way, Councilman. <laughs> um, I look at it as some of our staff field questions all the way up to the bid opening, and sometimes you feel like you give an answer that might give an advantage. And maybe you think that by issuing a quick clarifying addendum, everybody's got that information, but it's not a big enough addendum to warrant moving the bid date and delaying everything. So you just issue it. And, you mm -hmm. know, like I mentioned, I think, and we've talked about it as a staff internally, you know, I think that we'll. We'll set some sort of hard trigger in there. You get under a certain amount of days. Let's 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 reach out, and we've done it in the past, just not by policy. And sometimes mm -hmm. when it's not by policy, it doesn't get done the same way. So, so again, when I think about this, and I, then I lean towards what Councilman Schaefer said: tuition's never free. But as a as a representative of his constituents, and we're talking about levy reduction, that's real money. You know, that's real money. And if it's within our purview by letter of the law and the verbiage of the bids that we can adjust these non-material things, then it'll it'll tick off somebody. There's no question about that, but it's within our purview. And I think fiduciary, we have to go with the lowest bid. I don't like it. I think that it's attention to detail. And that makes me think, okay, the low bid may not spend enough time and attention to detail and that may reflect the job they do on the on the project i hope not but that's the perception i get without knowing them and john so. just a, a question again just kind of getting maybe a little bit more detail into it uh if i'm understanding right the addendum was issued because or was the addendum issued because somebody asked a question that you felt it was necessary to answer to everyone, that was the trigger that said, okay, yeah, we need to do this as an addendum rather than just somebody sent a neat question in by email and just emailing back to that one. I think that this could have been done by addendum or some sort of clarifying Q&A just sent to everyone. I think either way, as long as, 
I think I, I can see where where we why we did this. I understand why we did this because we we were offering the um, another option to get some work done to a contractor uh, with some of the sheet piling. We were giving them another option instead of removing it or cutting it off. They can push, push it down. it down, get it out of the way. And I think I included that in the memo. We mm -hmm. we were just giving another option, and sometimes another option can lead to a better price. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had that and didn't feel like they didn't know they could do something. Okay. And to give you the best price. And Sharon. Okay. I think being inefficient costs tax dollars, and we made an investment in the electronic bidding system for, in part, for efficiency. And if we now have to hold hands and go back and email this out or call people, we are now decreasing efficiency, and that adds tax dollars or cost money too. Um, I think we should follow the program. He didn't, he didn't read it. He had two plus days to read it. He got multiple notifications. The deviation is deemed immaterial, but yet we decided to issue an addendum. So it must have had some value to someone. And I don't know, I just would hate to see us now go to the point where we got to hold hands when we don't have to. That's a, that's a fair, yeah. do you mind, Mayor? Go ahead. Uh, that's a fair position, and I thought the same thing when Councilman Schaefer mentioned it. That's a fair position, and staff's happy to carry that out. We just wanted to make sure that that's the council's wishes because we think that there is opportunity to go either way here, and we wanted you to see that. Sure. Yep. It, Thank you. And John? Yeah, just clarification on that. You mentioned multiple notifications. Was more than one notification sent then to uh, to do that, or or you know, how many were sent? One. So it, there wasn't. So they just he got one notice saying, "Okay, you're incomplete." Or there's a he got a notice that there's an addendum. And look at it and do something with it. Correct. Basically. That's what we're aware of. We're aware that our program sends notification when the addendum is issued one time to all plan holders by email. So, Jason, question here, and this is maybe semantics, but so post bid opening, did you confirm with the with the low bidder that did they confirm that they actually saw it but didn't see it in time? Did they did they confirm that they saw it and that they understood that they should have replied to it? Jesse, would you like to answer that? Or yes. That? So the software the the software that talks to each other, one off the software tells us when the email notification goes out when we issue an addendum. It also has date and time tracking of when they confirmed receipt of that email. Okay. And they did not confirm receipt of that email until after the, the bid opening. opening. Okay. And part of this, and I and, and it doesn't necessarily change how I feel, but in the defense of the contractor that didn't acknowledge, I could understand, you know, I submitted it, I'm done. You know that's the end of my project so i'm not going to look at it again because like i said he's off you know busy and i'm, I'm sure that um they're they're relatively new in the business they're very competitive i'm sure that he's multitasking and probably not sitting in his office i'm sure he's operating and working in the field and running the equipment so i can understand that but then again i'm i'm just kind of a stickler if we're going to set something we really need to stay with it otherwise we're just making an awful lot of work for you guys that sure. certainly makes staff's position a little easier yep so I think everyone understands, uh, you Where know, what the all the detail and aspects that uh, went into this bid, and certainly we appreciate the, um, you know, staff bringing forward um, those alternatives and full, thoroughly explaining um, what the situation is. Is there any additional question, or are we ready for a motion, Russ? I was just ready to make a motion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we reject the non-conforming apparent low bid and authorize award of the project to the second low bid received from RG Construction for $98,950.44. Motion by Russ is seconded by Craig. Seconded. Discussion on that motion. <coughs> if not, I'll move us to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. aye. Let's have, just for the record, a division of the House. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed. And we have a 3-3 three, three because we have an <coughs> even number of people. So that motion does not prevail.
Is there an alternate motion? I make an alternate motion that we accept the apparent vote bidder. Is there a second, I'll, I'll second. A motion by Jim, seconded by John? Is discussion on that motion? Um, I understand the precedence that we're setting, but I also understand as a small bidder, he maybe never saw this email because I don't know. I'm with Quest. Some of this may have gone to junk. I don't know how to answer that, but Tom, like you said, Craig, this is a small company. He maybe never saw it. In two days, I think is too short. Um, you know, you said it went out Monday morning. Bids are due Wednesday. That's forty-eight hours. I know I've done these bids forty-eight hours. You may not see this. He said he, he said he saw it. He just didn't see at, it in time, but he said he got after, it after. So after, yeah. but. Um, the 48 hours, I think, is too short. I think where the staff needs, and again, I'm not picking on staff, but this is where staff needs to set, okay, after four days, we just don't do addendums anymore. We're done. So that's where I think we change our policies. We have a hard, set, fast rule. 72 hours or further out addendums, anything after 72 hours, we just do not send out addendums. And then we got that in stone. And I, you know, if we'd have had that policy, I'd have no problem, problem supporting you are motion, but at this point we don't have that, and I think that needs to be done. So at this point, I believe we accept this apparent low bidder, but the staff set a policy of where the drop dead time is for addendums, and that's hard and fast at that point. But Jim, we do have a, we do have a policy. We have a policy. We have a bid program that the contractor is supposed to acknowledge all aspects of the bid, whether they're addendums, the original bid, whatever. That's a policy that's in the bid program. Mm -hmm. It's in the Why, bid program. How do you, but it's want, not how a, do you want to it, default from that? It is not a city policy, correct, Jason? Well, it is. We do not have program. a city policy. On well, yeah. It. I think I think by default. Councilman Nebrilozinski, it is a policy because we bought the program and we used the program. And the bidders, by entering into the program, accept use of the program and all the yep. requirements therein, correct? I think the council could make that statement, and that's probably what we're here discussing now. Mm -hmm. Is that, Attorney yep. Matt Gross, you can help me out there, but I believe that you'd be making that determination. Correct. That's part of your discussion that you're having is do you reject or reserve the right to reject the non-conforming bid, declaring it non-material. So you reserve that right, it's just a matter of whether you want to utilize that and take that action. And I think we need to reserve that right for future, not just this bid, but future bids, because if we put paint ourselves in a corner, we, we could have something else coming here that's different than this. I mean, I'd be careful painting our staff into a corner too. Right. Well, it's my, my concern is it's non-material and we have the right to reject it, so yeah, you're right. People who voted to reject it and go with the next one, they didn't follow the addendum rule, but it's a non-material thing and it doesn't affect his bid. He's still coming in. That's an almost $14,000 savings to the city, to the taxpayers, and we're just talking about levy. So we can't have it both ways, in my opinion. We can't talk about saving levy and having our meeting tomorrow on budget and not funding a park project when we're spending an extra $14,000 for an immaterial change. That's like saying that I can drive 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. As long as I don't crash into anybody, I'm fine. But if I hit somebody, mm, then I violate it. I think that's pushing it. Well, <laughs> okay. kind of the principle. Other discussion on the motion? If not, we'll call for a vote on this motion. This motion is to award to the apparent no or recommended low bidder. All those in favor of the motion, let's save a little bit of time here. Raise your right hand. All those opposed, raise your right hand. So that motion does not pass. So I'll make the motion we reject them all and just have them do it again. What's the time frame on that? Ooh, ouch. Yeah. Ouch. So that's, that's so, really dangerous. Well, so you brought I don't, that, I don't everybody, know. everybody got to see the numbers. So just a clarification. Well, and maybe maybe I don't want to do that. I guess we need <laughs> to discuss it. What happens if we do do that? Because that's one of the alternatives that the city proposed. And the Jason, before you start, the um, so Councilmember Meister asked for that clarification. At the same time, are, are there other alternatives that perhaps we could consider? One being reject all bids. Or the other alternative would be table until the next regular council meeting where we would assume we would have a full council at that time. 
We have one council member that is not available tonight because of a family emergency. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, and Councilman, th that is an option. Uh, we did list that as an option. We did confer with our attorney staff about that as well. It's a, it is a valid and doable option. It's, however, our least preferred option uh, as a staff because of things that Councilman Schaefer mentioned. The, the numbers are on the table, the cards are out. Um, we, we, choose, we, we prefer not to do that unless you really have to. It's not, it's not preferred. Uh, we would prefer that we award to one or the other and potentially tabling is an opportunity if if we can't agree. I would make a motion to table it and I think that's a very good idea. I would second that. Motion by Jim, seconded by Steve to table till the next regular city council meeting. Discussion on that motion. Uh, the discussion would be the bids are still good. I believe we have 30 days. I believe that's what it says in the uh, I will tentatively say that we will be able to meet that timeline. We'll have to look at the schedule, and maybe we can look at that right now. And this won't trigger an addendum going out. <laughs> <laughs> Other discussion on the motion? If not, I'll call for a vote on this motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passed. Okay. So now we'll move on then to the next agenda item, which is the consent agenda. If we bring the items up on the screen that are on the consent agenda this evening. So on the consent agenda, uh, consider the annual agreement uh, renewal with Lutheran Social Services and Marshall Area Senior Citizen Center for 2022. Consider the application for exempt permit for uh, Buffalo Ridge Gobblers, uh, NWTF, uh, call for a public hearing regarding a proposed property tax abatement, location being 306 Athens, consider the approval of temporary on sale intoxicating liquor license for Marshall Area Chamber of Commerce, consider the approval of a temporary on sale intoxicating liquor license for Marshall Area YMCA, consider the temporary extension of the alcohol license area for Brow Brothers Brewing Company, one uh, 1010 East College Drive for Hopfest on September 10th, the 11th, 2021, and then consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. So is there any item on a consent agenda any member of the council wants removed for purposes of separate discussion? Move to approve consent agenda. Second. Motion by Steve, seconded by John to approve all of the items on the consent agenda discussion. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We'll then move to um, the agenda item number 15. This is an item that was removed or was tabled at the last regular council meeting. So the action would be to remove agenda, agenda item number 15 from the table for consideration this evening. Is there a motion I, to remove? I move to remove. No second. Motion by Craig, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, motion passes. So agenda item 15 is to consider uh, the tax increment financing resolution for sweet living. Sharon, do you want to start with this? Sure. Uh, staff have been discussing the tax increment financing resolution along with the development agreement. We have amended the development agreement for consideration Earlier tonight, the Housing Redevelopment Authority considered the uh, the redevelopment or the development agreement, and um, I'll have the EDA director provide an update on that, and then um, give a recommendation for uh, how to proceed at tonight's council meeting. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Sharon. Welcome, Lauren Deitz, EDA director. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So just a re brief recap of the project. Uh, Sweet Living did approach the city to build a $6.2 million uh, apartment complex, which would be a 48-unit workforce housing uh, targeted apartment, uh, a need which was identified within our housing study, which was recently completed. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, this was tabled for an opportunity for the HRA to 
to review the development agreement. At this time, uh, Council and HRA have been able to take a look at that uh, development agreement. The decision was made to postpone the approval of that development agreement in order for us to reevaluate finances as we approach the actual construction timeline. Um, because construction costs are coming down and there is several months uh, giving us that opportunity to make sure that the proposed amount that we have within our agreement is still uh, within reason. But with that, uh, staff is recommending that council does move forward with establishing the district and the TIF plan at this time. Um, that would just give us the opportunity to move forward with the project without having to restart the process in the spring with things like public hearings uh, that have already been completed. Uh, another thing to note is that even though we'd be establishing the TIF district and plan, we would not necessarily have to be certified unless the development agreement was approved at a later date. So it's just giving us an opportunity to have this discussion and continue the process uh, at this time. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Okay. Questions for Lauren? If not, uh, is there a a motion to approve the tax income and financing resolution for Sweet Living. I'd make the motion to approve the uh, uh, resolution establishing project area number six. And motion by John. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion does pass. Thank you, Lauren. Move on to new business. First item on new business is agenda item number 16. This is a uh, bud part of our budget process. This is a uh, the community contribution request for Marshall Area Fine Arts Council. So Jan Loft is here representing MAFAC. Good evening, Jan Loft. I'm here this evening to talk to you about the Marshall Area Fine Arts Council. And I especially want to thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, typically, I'd be at a finance meeting, but I'm secretary of the SMSU Booster Club, and we meet monthly tomorrow, as a matter of fact, at 4 o'clock. And they sort of expect the secretary to be there. So I'm <laughs> so. Anyway, I, I do appreciate the time that you're giving me this evening. Jan, well, no, Jan yes. I'm going to interrupt you. The, uh, right in front of you, there's a button on that the pillar that will lower. No, no, Kyle, you want to show her where, where it is? It will actually lower your table. So I think it will be a little more comfortable for you. Oh. For you. It will match more your height. Underneath here. Great technology. Yeah. The other way. Was that a statement on my height? <laughs> it was a compliment. <laughs> no, it was actually a dig on the height of the person before you. <laughs> well, now that uh, City Hall is back in the neighborhood, we're neighbors once again. In fact, we're just halfway down the uh, alleyway. We're located at 109 North 3rd Street, just around the corner. And if you'd move to the next slide, uh, just to remind you, we are a volunteer nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to presenting art exhibitions and performances, promoting local artistic talents and providing educational experiences. And I can't stress enough that we are a volunteer organization and we rely heavily on our volunteers, our membership contributions, our business sponsorships and grants and special allocations uh, such as what we get from the city. So it's very much appreciated. Just to highlight uh, some of the things were books on Third Street. In fact, one of our authors is here tonight. We do have a bookshop and it features books written by local and regional authors and books about Southwestern Minnesota. And we have a, a wide genre of books. So we're hoping that if anybody is looking for a book or a gift for someone, they'll consider stopping into Mayfac and taking a look at the books on Third Street. We also have, uh, there's our local. Oh, and I like to say, uh, that we try to promote shopping locally, shopping downtown, and shopping 3rd Street. We're, we're big boosters of downtown Marshall. The gift shop, uh, we have a gift shop filled with a wide array of gift items, and they were all designed 
and made by local and regional artists. We have everything from original paintings to photography, prints, lots of jewelry. We have baskets, uh, we have pottery, and uh, it's all on consignment. So when you purchase a unique gift from our gift shop, you're helping a local and regional artist. And I do say that they're one of a kind gifts. You find things in our gift shop that you won't see at uh, other shops around town. Moving on, a little night music was back at Liberty Park in July, and that is thank you entirely to the City of Marshall because it is the allocation that you give us that helps us to produce a little night music. We weren't able to do it last year, so we were really happy that we had four Wednesday evenings this past July, and we had great attendance. We probably had close to 400 people that uh, came to the various concerts, and you know, what night at uh, Liberty Park isn't a good night, right? Okay, moving on. Something new this year, Art in the Park, it was back in June of this summer. We learned something. That was one of those June Saturdays. Remember we had those days that were like 96, 97, 98 degrees. They were excruciating. And on this particular Saturday, we had 93 free art kits distributed to kids K through 12. Started at noon, we were at Justice Park, and we were out of those kits in 50 minutes in spite of the heat and everything else, they were all there. And so what we learned is in the future, we'll get more free art kits if we do something like this in the future, and we probably will. Uh, fingers crossed, the concert series is back this year. We were unable to host the concerts last year due to the pandemic. We'll see how it goes. But uh, you can see we have our first concert coming up on Sunday, October 3rd. That by the name, by the way, is pronounced Taiji, Waking Up in America. It's two sisters and then their accompanists. And uh, the Prairie Arts Chorale was supposed to celebrate their 40th anniversary last year unable to do so. So they'll be with us on Friday, November 5th. Baron Ryan, November 21st at the Marshall Middle School as uh, the Prairie Arts Corral will be. And then in March, the Chipper Experience, that's gonna be a big family experience. The guy is, he's zany, but it's a lot of fun for kids and family. And then we'll finish up the season in May back at the Marshall Middle School. And the next slide just shows you the artists that are coming in. The guy in the middle, he's the chipper experience. You know, he's a little more offbeat than the other two, but uh, very, um, very good musicians. The art gallery, we change out our exhibit about every six weeks, and we've had everything from stained glass to photography, oils, textiles, mixed media, a wide uh, variety of mediums. And uh, that's a poster from one of our exhibits earlier this year. And the next slide shows uh, Dancing with My Paintbrush. That's uh, the exhibit that's there right now. And uh, we just closed out uh, John Sterner's. Okay, here are the numbers. I'm not a good numbers person. But I can tell you that even though Joanne Fraunfelder has moved, and she now lives in Rapid City, South Dakota. Joanne has very graciously agreed to always run our numbers for us every month. So Joanne is the one that uh, comes up with these numbers and tries to explain them to you as best uh, she can or the best we can. We try very, very hard to be fiscally conservative. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we got through 2020 while closed for two months. We were shut down pretty much the entire month of April and, uh, well, March and April and didn't reopen until May 19th of 2020. So we think we did a pretty good job with that. But that lets you see uh, our income. And uh, we could not unlock the doors were it not for the grant and special grants and special allocations that that we also receive. Joanne made a, a real nice slide for you next. She knows how to do those things, you know, pretty, pretty wheels um, laying things out our revenue compared to the actual budget. And then the next slide is uh, expenditures to the annual budget. <clears throat> 
And I do want to add that we just very recently applied for the new grant that Visit Marshall offered to people and uh, we did receive a small grant through that and so we're going to be able to do a lot more newspaper advertising and we have an in-kind sponsor with the local radio station so we'll be doing some advertising there as well as our, our, our typical um, publicity booklet that we put together. So very, very grateful for that uh, Visit Marshall grant. And just to uh, finish things up, again, uh, we try to motivate building community through the arts, through our exhibits, our performance, and our educational experiences. And uh, we are a volunteer organization, and we thank the council for your past generosity, and uh, we thank you very much for that. Any questions? But if they involve those numbers, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer them real well. Um, you know, maybe we maybe we could text Joanne out in Rapid City, <laughs> yeah. but you know, hey, it's only you know like six. ten after six in Rapid uh, City, so it's early, right? <laughs> oh. Thank you. Any questions? If not, thank well, you. Well, thank much. you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you very much. You. We'll move then to agenda item number seventeen. This is an informational item from the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, represented by Marty Seifert. Marty, there's a button right in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should have paid attention to, to that. <laughs> I'm not saying you're tall or anything. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Marty Seifert. I work with Flaherty and Hood, which is contracted with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Um, the coalition is a, a long-standing, decades-long organization. Marshall was one of our original members. I think it was probably preceded you, Bob, actually, in terms of membership. I'm, I was thinking it was uh, founded in like 1985 or something like that. Um, but uh, we represent uh, 109 rural cities uh, scattered throughout rural Minnesota. We advocate on a variety of issues, and I, I have one slide that I'll just speak from tonight. Um, the highest priority has always been for the organization, local government aid, it's preservation and enhancement. Um, we went from offense to defense in the budget two years ago. We were able to get our, our ask, and we, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, were, were able to pass through uh, enhancement to local government aid. Uh, Marshall, not as dependent on local government aid as some of our other members, but is a significant portion of the budget. If it went away, it certainly would be a, a difficult budget situation, but for some of the smaller communities, it's 50 or 60 percent of their budget. Um, as we went in, entered into the pandemic, um, there was discussion about a multi-billion dollar deficit last year. And of course, local government aid is oftentimes on the chopping block. So we worked with the governor's office, Department of Revenue, make sure it, get paid, it gets paid on time in full. Uh, they agreed with that. Um, magically, we went from a major multi-billion dollar deficit to a surplus, largely because the federal government rained a lot of money down on, on Minnesota. and. Um, we ended up with a one-time supplemental aid that the Senate came up with for those cities that were going to go backwards due to formula anomalies and no reductions otherwise. So we, we met our goal on local government aid moving from offense to defense. Um, next two items relate to uh, environmental issues. Uh, PFA, of course, is an extremely important part of, of how we fund wastewater, drinking water, etc. cetera. Um, here in Marshall, of course, we got a... a uh, grant um, for I want to say seven million dollars was the total um, you could imagine spreading that over our population we are one of the few organizations that lobbies uh, on PFA because why why would anybody else be interested in it that much perhaps the contractors but uh, at the end of the day we have to pull together because largely PFA benefits rural communities and so we are there strongly lobbying on the PFA side of things. There was no bonding bill this year. This is, tends not to be a bonding year. We do those every other year uh, traditionally in Minnesota, but we were able to get in almost $16 million in the legacy bill uh, that largely go to rural communities, um, keep that money flowing, and the next year we'll be uh, back with the $100 million ask in the uh, bonding bill. Uh, the PFAS source reduction uh, initiative is, is something that was uh, Put together uh, last year was an idea that, you know, why don't we try to reduce uh, some of the wastewater costs by 
um, preventing some of this stuff from getting into the waste stream to, to begin with. And so that, that there's a stakeholder group that got put together, and we think that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, child care is the next three. We advocated for a uh, child care facilities grant. I think a lot of people understand that when it comes to child care, um, it, it, it is very difficult to make a cash flow work on child care in some of these rural communities. If you have debt service on the side for a building and you're paying staff and you have supplies and your revenue stream isn't very good, it is extremely difficult. So uh, we advocated for $20 million in bonding for, for uh, facility grants. We ended up getting 225 and people are like, well, how would you get more money than what you asked for? That rarely happens. Well, we, in the case of the federal government raining all this money down, we had appropriations chairman looking for places to put money in because there was so much money to spend, frankly, at the end of the day. And so this was something that they felt was important. There was a need for it. And uh, we're hoping that th those dollars will get utilized for more child care slots. And, uh, you know, the other two are important. Those were uh, initiatives to, to try to help people get training and business development plans put together. There's a lot of people who love kids who want to open child care, but they don't know how to run a payroll. They don't know the safety and the health aspects and food safety and those types of things that are, are critical to run a child care. Uh, and, and frankly, in a lot of our, our uh, smaller communities, the in-home child care is a big uh, solution to this. It's not about a big child care center where there's hundreds of kids. It, it might be someone that has their home opened up for uh, half a dozen kids and that we can solve that. We have been collecting um, uh, issues and stories. We, we had our conference um, recently up in Alexandria of uh, challenges with regulatory issues. Um, we had uh, the mayor of Ely said that they had a uh, in-home child care. They have one licensed provider. They have someone that helps that licensed provider. The licensed provider leaves to go get diapers or groceries for 10 minutes. Um, the unlicensed providers are watching those four or six kids. They could lose all of their funding because the licensed person left for 10 minutes. That's just dumb. It's not a partisan issue. It's not rural or urban. It's just kind of a dumb issue. Um, we had another example up in northwestern Minnesota where there, the state is requiring people have to have a four-year degree to open a child care center. They had two ladies probably in their upper 50s who were going to open a child care center, had a technical college degree, one more on the business side, one more on kind of the humanitarian side. Uh, nope, you don't have a four-year degree, you can't open this up. I mean, that, that's just things that states around us don't have these issues. So we're going to try to come up and quantify some of these regulatory issues. We're not going to fund our way out of this, and we're not going to deregulate our way out of it. It has to be a blending of these two issues to solve this child care thing. Uh, next page, uh, just real quickly, um, the uh, BDPI program, which Marshall has used uh, some years ago, um, that is a program that, that we came up with in our office. It was, it was invented under Ventura. It was funded under Palenti. Essentially what it is is if you have a, a business that wants to either start in Minnesota or grow in Minnesota, this helps with the public infrastructure, a sewer pipe, a water pipe, a service road, uh, something to help that business uh, uh, be competitive. And, and we're not going to pay for the you know, the roof on your building, but any kind of public infrastructure will help pay for it. Because there is no bonding bill, we didn't have bonding, but we did get some money for cash and that deal. Uh, housing, I know, you know, John, you've worked on this for, for years. Um, housing, we came up a little bit short on some of our goals. There was a new idea on, on a fix-it fund for, sometimes you have housing that needs a little bit of help. You don't have to knock it down or whatever, but we've been finding out some of these large apartment complexes in the Twin Cities are two, 300000 per unit, which, which as a taxpayer, some of us find very frustrating that they're not utilizing housing we already have. Um, and so some of these things are, I think, a, a good example of, of using some ingenuity. And we're going to work with the legislature to, to try to push those forward next year. Workforce Development Fund, we put another $4 million in. That's been a largely successful program. And then lastly, in transportation, um, there's a modest increase in the MSA, but not a lot. Um, there was no increase in gas tax. Of course, people are very sensitive on that issue right now. Um, for the small cities that are under 5000 we did get $18 million in one-time appropriations for those. Um, and as I've been giving my report to other cities around uh, the state, obviously Marshall is in very good shape in terms of its population, but uh, you know, Redwood Falls, 
sitting at 5,200 people and they went backwards and they, they just made the cutoff, they're at 5,100. Um, if they, for example, went down to 4,999, they would have had three to four hundred thousand dollars disappear from their city budget. So that's where the Constitution in Minnesota cuts it off at five thousand. I know Morris was right at five thousand. I'm not sure where they came out. I have to look at the numbers on the census, but five thousand is a really big deal for some of these cities. Unfortunately, for some like Laverne, Pipestone, St. James, and Wyndham, they're all at that forty-six hundred to five thousand category, and they're not quite there. Um, so we, we're not going to change the Constitution, so our solution is take general fund appropriations and try to float that in for these smaller cities that, that need it. Um, for the city streets of Marshall size, um, we have always been advocating for $25 million to be added on to what you receive in the gas tax revenues. Um, roughly out of a gas tax dollar, about 59% of it goes to the Trunk Highway Fund, about 29% to the county, and about 9% goes in the pool that Marshall will receive from in cities like New Alm and Worthington, but the small cities do not receive that. We have to lobby for them to get the, uh, the extra appropriations. I can answer any questions that you might have or concerns or... Thank you, Marty. Any questions the council has? Thank you. We appreciate the work that the coalition does, okay. so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. We'll move then to agenda item number 18, the Enterprise Fleet Management. We have a proposal to review. Um, Kyle, are you going to start with this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is this Michael K. Still, or should I come to the podium? I think the podium. We'd, we're, those three microphones we'll are not successful. Up. So There's a button here. I'll get two to lower <laughs> yeah. this. <so. laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Um, 2018 and 2019 staff began to work with Enterprise Fleet Management on just exploring uh, fleet management options um, for our city fleet vehicles. Um, we had explored this option and ultimately it was paused um, during that time uh, until uh, August work session where it was requested by a couple of the council members um, more or less a consensus from the me remaining members of that meeting to explore, revisit the fleet management option with Enterprise. So uh, after that meeting, I had reached out to our contact uh, with Enterprise Fleet Management, Wong Nystrom, who has joined us via Zoom this evening um, to update our vehicle, inf our fleet information with him. He has compiled some information which is in the council packet um, and I will let him kind of provide that information in greater detail uh, for you tonight. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Wong. Hi, um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you, council members and mayor. Um, I'm glad to know that I don't have any buttons to push to put myself higher. So <laughs> I can go up and down. Um, what you see before you, I wanted to start with the city of Marshall fleet profile, if everyone can see that, perfect. Um, this is the current uh, synopsis of the state of the fleet uh, for the city of Marshall. And what we're looking for starting on the left-hand side is the type of vehicles from a full-size sedan, minivan, all the way down to the one-ton pickup truck. Uh, this is the light duty vehicles of the city. Um, then the number of the vehicles in the next column after that under number of type. And then the average age of those vehicles then the average annual miles being driven and the what we're recommending on the bottom well what you can see is the total average is 51 vehicles the average age of the vehicles is 9.3 years and an average of 6,000 miles um, the mileage pattern is very typical uh, of uh, a city fleet uh, as well as the age of the vehicles for an older fleet um, what we're recommending is looking at the fleet replacement schedule next that you see there that shows what we're recommending is uh, for 2022 is to uh, acquire 23 vehicles, um, then in 2023, four vehicles, then eight, then seven, then nine. Uh, the reasoning for those numbers is on the top right that says replacement criteria. So the 23 vehicles being recommended, <clears throat> um, they are either 10 years old or older and have an odometer of over 100,000 miles on them. 
Then in the next fiscal year, we're looking at in 2023, uh, the replacement criteria is eight years or uh, the odometer over 80,000 miles. And then you can see the, the remaining, basically what we're saying for the criteria. As for the bottom half, what you're looking for is a model year analysis. 23 of those vehicles are identified based on the age of the vehicles. Um, you have obviously five vehicles over 20 plus years, um, but th that gives you a guide of what the model age of those vehicles are, representing all the way from 2013 to 2021, what you currently have in your fleet as well. So when we look at the numbers, what does that tell us obviously is your 45% or more of your current light duty uh, fleet is over 10 years old, so, which has greatly impacted the, uh, the resale um, and in our opinion, the fuel economy, the operating costs and the resale um, significantly on your fleet. So we'll jump right now um, to the analysis portion. So what we did is do a fleet planning analysis on outside looking in from a professional fleet management company services provider, um, what we would recommend doing. And looking at your current fleet on top of 51 vehicles, your current cycle is 12.75 years. The current average maintenance spend uh, is $100 per vehicle per month. That's a conservative outside estimate that we've uh, looked at the data that you've given us provided uh, in uh, past in 2018, but it's a little bit jumbled on the maintenance data because uh, we're being conservative. We know that that number actually goes up uh, over time the longer you keep a vehicle. The average current fuel economy for, for the fleet is around 16 miles to the gallon. What we're recommending is a cycle pattern around 3.06 years on your fleet and a proposed maintenance cost of $38, which is quite a reduction in what your current maintenance costs are. And we use $3 a gallon uh, just as, a, as a, a base number. Obviously fuel fluctuates up and down. This is just the standard deviation. In yellow, what you're gonna see is the one that says average. And that average line is looking at your fleet data, the, what the city out of the 51 vehicles on the light duty side, the average amount of vehicles you buy for this fleet of replacement each year is four vehicles a year, two of which are patrol uh, police vehicles. Um, so the other two is what the rest of the city gets and the not unmarked patrol vehicles um, are, are two vehicles being replaced. Average purchase price of $139,000, $778, 139, almost $140,000 basically is what you spend on those four vehicles. So roughly um, speaking, that's what you pay for four vehicles averaging around $35,000 uh, roughly in price per vehicle on the light duty fleet. With that, the maintenance is around $61,000. That's what your entire fleet and maintenance cost averages to run 51 vehicles. Then your fuel costs around estimated around $57,000. So your average annual fleet budget on a given year is 258,000. So it's never exactly perfect that you buy four vehicles a year. That's just what you're averaging. Some years you buy five, some years you buy one, that sort of thing, it's just an average. So your fleet budget is around $258,000. What we represent then in 2022, starting with the next line down, um, what we're recommending is leasing 23 vehicles. That would leave you with owning 28 vehicles. So you have 23 vehicles leased. The lease payment total for year one is $159,000. Obviously that's about $20,000 more than what's in your average CIP budget each year. However, when we take those 23 vehicles and give an extremely low conservative number of just $1,000 a piece in value, that subtracts $23,000 from that budget line, 
that would be given obviously as a credit to the city. Then what we're recommending is some vehicles are replaced that are easily have the resale value of being able to be exchanged after one year and you'd actually attain another $14,000 in resale dollars back to the city. By doing 23 vehicles versus the average of four that you're doing, we're going to greatly reduce maintenance costs on your fleet, providing obviously little to no downtime on the newer vehicles, safe, safer vehicle fleet throughout the city that will make an immediate impact and then offer better fuel economy as well on that fleet. So your fleet budget goes down to $218,000, um, which is around $40,000 net savings to the city. What we're asking for, obviously, is not for the council to spend more money to, it, to acquire 23 brand new vehicles. You're actually going to save around $40,000 conservatively, but getting 23 vehicles interjected into the city while we sell 23 of the older ones. Going back to the next year after that, you can see what we've, we've shown. If you look at 2023, um, a little bit go farther down to the left so they can see 2023, there you go. Then all, all through 2031, as we're continuing to lease more vehicles until the entire fleet, roughly 51 vehicles are all under the program, As you can see there, all the vehicles would be under lease, 51 vehicles, okay? And the average fleet budget then would, on the lease payment would be $398,000. But you can also see that you're going to get equity on those vehicles when we turn them in at the right time using our um, fleet's analytics that we do for our entire fleet. We're going to more standardize the fleet, giving you lower maintenance costs continually year over year, better fuel economy, and getting the resale dollars by selling the vehicles at the right time with a net cash savings after 10 years, conservatively for the city of over $250,000 in the first 10 years. And then if you slide a little bit to the right, sustaining that after the 10 years to an average of about $10,852 less expensive than using your current fleet budget of $258,000 that should be sustainable to continue to cycle the vehicles at the appropriate times so you always have a consistent fleet. And that's what we're looking for in the overall picture of representing hiring fleet uh, enterprise fleet management as your fleet uh, services provider uh, for the city of Marshall. I'm open to, to questions and I can dive into any comments or questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nystrom. A, a very um, a complete and efficient presentation. So thank you for that. Are there any questions at this time? Yeah. John? Uh, regards to the uh, the sale of the present fleet, uh, and you're taking uh, year one, the 23 that are sold, you're estimating $23,000 for getting in for that. Uh, do we sell those? Do you sell those? What's the, uh, what's the situation on that? We pick them up and we sell them for the city. And you'll get uh, what we uh, get for those vehicles. And Enterprises charges a flat $500 fee to pick it up and transport it and get it ready for sale by hand selling the vehicles to uh, under a competitive bid process that satisfies the uh, local city and state um, compliance for selling vehicles. But because we're able to hand sell them, we're able to greatly increase the return uh, back to the city uh, above trade-in or auction values that, that most cities and counties go through is a government auction. Um, that is returned to the city um, as equity and money. And when I say $23,000, that's, that's just 
a very conservative estimate using your vehicles are worth just $1,000 a piece, that's not reality. The reality is they're going to be worth tens of thousands of dollars more than that. What we're showing you in the analytics is just a very conservative view of accountability that we want to be based on. So when we do pick them up, if they're worth, can you get $50,000 or $80,000, or whatever that number is, that would go to the city. Thank you. Other questions? Jim? When you say you sell them, is there a prep fee before you sell those used vehicles we're charged or do you sell them as we give them to you? We sell them as, as you tell us to come pick them up and they're ready for sale. And then the second question, after 10 years, after all these vehicles are leased, the city no longer has any ownership of the vehicles, correct? Correct. So if we would opt out of enterprise, we would have to purchase 51 vehicles ourselves? No. Okay. Explain. Absolutely. There, when I say the word lease, it's misleading um, because it's, it's not the lease that you see on TV that you're known for, what most people know, know a lease is. Uh, a lease that you see on TV is called a closed-end lease. And what that represents is basically a monthly payment over a fixed period of time, and you're dinged with wear and tear or excess mileage, and you have no ownership rights to that. And you can't drill holes and, and alter the vehicle um, without waiving the manufacturer warranty. And you certainly don't get the equity at the end either because it's not your vehicle. You turn it back in and you get another vehicle. Uh, what enterprise leases are is, is the opposite of that called a uh, an open-end lease versus a closed-end lease, which is what you see on TV. An open-end lease is essentially a financed to own the vehicle. So you'll be financing the leased vehicle. I call it a lease only because a third party bought it for you and I hold title while you're paying me down to a residual. So as you're making the payments, you're lowering the depreciation and paying on the vehicle. As the vehicle it comes to term, we pick that vehicle up and we sell it on your behalf. Um, once the residual is paid off, the city would get the equity back from the sale of that vehicle. So it's a finance to own uh, setup. And so you're, we're building an equity pool that we can draw from for future um, ways to, to continue to acquire vehicles. If the city ever backed out and does not want to, you can always complete the purchase the same phase in way that you bought into. You can e each year appropriate if you average $140,000 in, in vehicles um, to buy four, you can slowly buy out the vehicles that have been leased and run it for as long as you want. So if the city wanted to go back to a, a 10 or 12 year cycle, you, you could buy out a fleet of 10 each year for the next five years, and then you would have your 51 vehicles back owned by the city. So you would not need to buy 51 vehicles if you ever got out of the program. You would just phase it back in, so $140,000, and you'll eventually own your entire fleet again. Okay, thank you. John, you have another question? Yeah, are the police cars calculated in your 51? I'm not clear on that. Yes, that includes so they are. the police department, yes. And yeah, the departments are, if you'd like, it's the street department, airport, park maintenance, police department, engineering, motor pool, um, uh, waste water department, fire department, community service department, uh, the merit center, and various other departments, but all the light duty fleet that I was given. So out of curiosity, what's your... Uh, availability of police cars at this point. Uh, are you able to get them as compared to when cities purchase them and get them about a year later? We're able to help that process and that's one of the biggest reasons for our, our success um, during the, the pandemic. Um, we partnered up with Lyon County recently, uh, when you're neighboring counties. We work with Yellow Medicine. Uh, we're in the final stages with the board with Cottonwood County. The city of Wyndham partnered up with us recently. I'm actually doing the proposal for Minnehaha County in, in South Dakota. We work with Southwest Health Services for years now uh, within uh, very close to your county. Sanford Health, Essential Health um, are, are a few others. 
But one of the key issues, obviously, that we're coming to the board on and, and hoping for a, a quicker turnaround is because the vehicle uh, supply chain is such a huge issue. Um, Ford and a lot of the manufactured vehicles will have a limited time window open to order vehicles for 2022. If you don't place those orders in, uh, in the next 30 to 60 days, there will be nothing to order. They'll all be cut off. So you'll have to continue to run your older fleet and aging. That obviously affects all the departments. The reason why we're able to get vehicles sooner is we don't always wait for the state contract to come out and wait. We order the vehicles when the order banks open up by the manufacturer. So we get in line first, then other cities and counties that wait for all the processes going on. The good news with, with, with enterprise is to be able to get your orders in faster, you'll get the vehicles sooner. And the great news is we don't make a dime on selling you the vehicle. We make money when you're making a monthly payment and in a lease charge like you would when you finance a car. That's how we make money. So we're not obviously a, a, a nonprofit. We make money, but it's low margins over a long-term partnership is our goal. So by getting orders in as soon as the order banks open ahead of the, the rest of the uh, cities and counties that aren't with us, there's a delayed reaction on who gets vehicles first. I think the, um, are there any other questions? I think the, uh, first off, this is a very good presentation. We do have the numbers now. We have a budget workshop tomorrow evening. I'm not sure we're ready to take action on this this evening. I think we want to talk about it in our budget workshop. It may actually also take um, some additional review by our Ways and Means Committee and perhaps our uh, Vehicle Committee and Equipment Committee also. Um, but I think all of that is doable, that if we're, there is an action, we can have that in September, so it's still a timely um, Decision is that okay with the council? Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you uh, for the presentation. Is there any other input from the council? If not, I'll move us along then to the next agenda item, uh, which is um, the next agenda item would be agenda item number nineteen. This is somewhat of a housekeeping item. This is uh, consider an amendment to the purchasing ordin ordinance, and this would actually uh, make our purchasing policy, which was recently amended. Uh, consistent with our purchasing ordinance, Annette, and thank you. There's a, no, I won't say that. <laughs> no, you know, go ahead, uh, you don't. Down, okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, as the Mayor had stated, this is a housekeeping item. Um, staff feel that making this minor change to the purchasing, or to the um, yeah, purchasing ordinance, um, it, it currently a, references a $5,000 maximum um, that has been there since its inception in 1976. Um, so it has not been updated since then. Um, by making this change, it would then reference the um, council approved purchasing policy. So staff do not feel that um, council would no longer have any oversight um, on the actual spending authority. Um, that way, future changes to the purchasing policy, which gets reviewed at least annually, um, it's just more in line um, and a little bit more efficient for staff not to have to have to um, update both the ordinance and the policy. Thank you, Annette. Any questions on this? If not, is there a motion? So make a motion to approve the amendment. Second. Motion by John, seconded by Jim. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. We'll move then to agenda item number 20, consider the purchase agreement for property, 800 North Highway 59. Um, Sharon? Uh, yes, we uh, did have communication with the real estate on record. And we did, as a result of a closed session discussion, make an offer on a portion of that property that was listed. And uh, we did get a response back from the seller through their real estate uh, agent on record. And I will have uh, our public safety director who led the discussions come forward and provide an update and seek additional uh, direction and possibly approval of a, of a purchase agreement.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. The last item of business on your agenda for tonight <laughs> should Thanks be, yeah, yeah, there Thanks you go. For waiting, yeah. <laughs> is obviously the, uh, regarding the property at 800 North uh, Highway 59 and uh, your consideration of moving forward with the purchase agreement. And I believe it was the second week of July, we went into a closed session and you gave us um, some direction to city staff to move forward with the discussion and possible negotiations with. Uh, the property owner and we did that shortly after that meeting a number of uh, city staff personnel went and had a chance to walk through that facility again and uh, i think we all were in agreement that there's a great value to that property and and that we could utilize it within our department um, we maybe didn't work out the logistics of that but we know that there's value and that there's a need for it um, shortly after that we began discussion with the property owner and uh, had good communication there were some things that we wanted clarified and uh, maybe some contingencies on our end. Uh, one thing specifically was a legal description of the property. We wanted to make sure that matched the property that we uh, wanted to buy. And uh, they agreed to, to that stipulation. And there was a number of them. I'll just try to highlight maybe a few of them, Jason, if I'm missing some. Uh, second one was uh, um, there was an uh, information regarding any agreements to have in place with Verizon. I believe uh, earlier in the year, or maybe last year, the council had uh, I think uh, permitted the process for possibly a cell tower and we wanted to know if there was any agreements and and in place and I think we got th that answered. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was an agreement regarding the shared access and the, the road entrance, uh, yeah, the driveway entrance into the facility that there was an agreement in place and if not that we would be able to draft that agreement with the other party that would be purchasing the north side of that. and. Uh, Anything else? What am I thinking? Some other things maybe that we missed. But anyway, we had great discussion with the property owner. And uh, maybe the last thing was that uh, they would be open to the city drafting the purchase agreement and uh, moving forward. So I can open it up for any discussions. I think the purchase agreement was included with your packet. And Dennis was very, um, very involved with that process. I know he's not here tonight, and I don't know if Matt had a chance to review the document a little bit, but if you have any questions, I'm open for questions. So just some um, information for the public, the, um, and you can help me with any details that maybe I don't cover completely. This is the former, a portion of the former Doug's Auto salvage and buildings, and that were used for cold, cold storage, and they will be used if this are purchased by the city for cold storage and replacing um, a cold storage facility that is currently um, owned by RELCO and RELCO will be more fully utilizing their building for their manufacturing process. So um, in the future that won't be available to us and so those items that are in cold storage there from a variety of, of departments including street department, wastewater, and um, very importantly our public safety for our impounded vehicles that need to be held in a secure location until um, whatever process that that vehicle was involved in uh, goes through the, uh, the court system. So this property will accommodate all of that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Questions for Jim or Sharon or any of the other staff that have been involved in this? I think there's been quite a bit of discussion and involvement from uh, multiple departments on this. Jim, the, the purchase price is less than what was listed. And in addition, there was additional property added. That's correct. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I, I propose that uh, we grant approval to move forward with establishing the purchase agreement to purchase the property at 800 North Highway 59. Motion by Craig. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Seconded by Jim. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We'll move then on to uh, agenda item number 21, uh, Commission Board Liaison Report. So thankfully mine have not met since we last met, so I'll, I have no report this evening. Craig? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Airport Commission met last week. Um, got caught up with uh, some maintenance items. And Jason, if I miss anything on this, okay, just yell at me. So they were very glad to have me back in person for sure. They, the, the chair made very good note of that. Um, 
the uh, there was an election of officers and those officers remained the, the same as before. There was a little bit of a railroad job, which is totally appropriate when you're working with airplanes. And uh, we did discuss a little bit about the future of the fueling um, piece out there, the fixed base operator that now takes care of owns and operates the, the fueling um, is looking to do that, that he feels that that system is, is closely uh, going to be due to be upgraded and replaced. And, and uh, I think the consensus of the, the commission would be to recommend that, that he come in and basically look at closure of the current site and then propose that the city would work to uh, invest in the new system and I, I think that there was consensus that that would probably be a positive recommendation to be brought forward to council at a point in time that the city would own, but certainly not operate, that it would be operated by whoever the FBO is, but that because it's on city property, that it would actually be owned by us. And then we'd have to look at the, what the actual pumpage is and, and look at those. But um, I know that we had requested, the, the commission had requested information from the FBO for what exactly is the flow rate or pump rate there. And we're still waiting for that information to come back to make the decision. But um, other than that, things are moving on. There's uh, applications continuing to go into <coughs> MnDOT Aviation for uh, continued <laughs> upgrades and improvements. I know one of the discussions is looking at the pavement that goes back out to the T hangers. That's probably something that we're gonna need to look to pay attention to. And, um, and then just also discussion of uh, I think maybe some additional uh, tenants out there with the ag application. There was some conversation about that, but um, things are going forward very well. Um, of course, there was always question about how are we doing with Helena, you know. So there is concern about you know where are we at with Helena as, as the council is. So um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Okay, thank you, Craig. Steve. Cable Commission did not meet. Community Services Advisory Board had the pool meeting today, which I was not able to go to because of work obligations. EDA meets tomorrow. Thank you, John. Uh, like Councilman Meister said, EDA meets tomorrow. Uh, MMU changed their meeting last week from Tuesday to Thursday due to a um, conference, and I was not able to attend. Uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission uh, continues to meet with the subcommittees planning the uh, Welcome Week, uh, which is primarily September 18th is the main day uh, for that. So just keep that date in mind and open and be ready to attend uh, a welcoming to citizens of Marshall. That's it. Thank you, John. Russ? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Adult Community Center, I'll try and keep all these short to the lack of time. Uh, we approved the contract with uh, Lutheran Social Services uh, going up a little bit. You know, three cents doesn't make a difference, but they average about 350 meals a week. So they continue to see, you know, participation in that. Uh, they have an open position and they had nine applicants. They interviewed four and offered the position to a couple, but uh, all turned it down because of no benefits. So um, visit Marshall CVB. We met um, pretty much everything going on, planning a, the move out to the Red Baron Arena. One interesting fact is that uh, they're, they're starting an SMU, SMSU familiar uh, bus two times a year, free of charge. They're gonna offer a bus free of charge to the students to get acquainted with the city of Marshall. So that's something new that they haven't done before. TAC, uh, Transit Commi Advisory Committee, uh, graphics have been installed on a couple of bus stops. They too continue to uh, have troubles finding staff. Uh, especially part-time and full-time both. And then uh, they're also talking about discussing having a dedicated shovel, shuttle service during Marshall's 150th. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Jim. Um, update on City Hall. We met yesterday. Uh, there's a few things still being taken care of. We, I'll be honest with you, we sent Brennan a letter stating that we want these done by September 30th um, because they are dragging their feet a little bit and there's just small things that need to be taken care of. So we continue to work with our um, staff to get that done. Uh, I was at the pool meeting today. Uh, within the next month or two, there should be a conceptual drawing coming to the city we did settle on. Uh, it was option A. I, I'm sure Sharon could share that with you of what we decided to go with. Um, and then we'll start working, they'll start working on what the budget's gonna be. So it has been scaled down from what they originally brought in. Okay. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> we'll move along then to council member individual items, uh, Craig. 
I don't have anything, thank you. Steve? Nothing. Jim? Nothing. Russ? I just want to put out a big thank you to the uh, city staff, park and rec, streets, public safety, everybody regarding all their help this past weekend for a very successful Sounds of Summer event. Uh, and to make a long story short, Mark and I had an opportunity to visit with one of the Schwann family members and broached the idea of, of having them as, as Grand Marshals for 2022, so next year. But thank you again to all city staff for all your help. We really appreciated it. That's all I have. And, and John, nothing. We'll move along then to staff report. Sharon? In the essence of time, I have nothing, Mr. Mayor. And Jason? Here's a little button there if you want to raise that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be really brief, um, and I'll leave that alone. Um, the, for the state aid mill and overlay project, we can expect to see the mill in town tomorrow. So there'll be no parking signs along, crude no parking signs along a lot, a lot of routes. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And if any residents happen to be watching, don't park there when the sign says no parking. The mill's coming to to uh, uh, remove some surfacing. The, the paving should follow shortly thereafter. Ideally, weather permitting, we see paving on Southview Drive potentially at the end of this week. I know that that's where they plan to start, which is good for us. Um, so is it, Southview is their first priority? That is what we're being told. Okay, yeah. good. Which is good. Um, only other thing I'll mention is SRF will be in town. They're the consultant working on the comp plan with us. They'll be in town September 16th, so just after our next council meeting, to meet with various staff and uh, take a tour of the community and, and really get started. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Any questions for Jason? Thank you. On behalf of city attorney. Um, I have no report for the council mayor. So we'll move along to the remaining items, the information items that you have for your review. Agenda item number 27 is consideration to go into closed session to talk about city parking lot development. Is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim to go into closed session. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. We'll take a very short recess and then we'll be in closed session.